options on Chris Van Dersen, the fish tank. And he's going to raise with 10, eight of spades. Reynolds out. Oh. oh, look at this. Andre picking up the weapons of mass destruction, the pair of aces. Yep, he's in the small blind here. He's the rocket man. Just kind of call here. I'm not fond of this play. And the reason I'm not fond of it is because you entice the big blind to call, where now you have to be two players with the aces instead of just one. Well, those are a couple of big ass hands that don't three bet pre flop, Jonathan. What is going on here? We've got aces for the small blind. That's Andre. He has the shortest stack, uh, second shortest stack at the table, shortest stack in the hand with 22 blinds to start the hand. The big blind, blind Chris Lee, has a, a nice stack. What's going on with these flats? Well, okay, the first thing that's important to know is that Chris V, the opener, is an amateur. So Andre, with his 21, or really 22 blinds when he starts here, uh, has got to be targeting Chris V when he makes this flat because... It really, it doesn't make any sense normally to flat with a hand, even as strong as aces here, because it's just too transparent, right? When you have 21, 22 blinds, you're in this small blind and the cutoff opens, you're shoving pretty much your entire playing range, if not literally your entire playing range here. And you have to shove aces too. I know it's, I know it's tempting to call because you fold out so much stuff, but you're, you're shoving ace-jack, you're shoving ace-ten, you're shoving king-queen, you're shoving king-jack, you're shoving two fives. You just have to keep aces in there. Otherwise, it's way too easy to make calls against you with, with way more hands, right? When you're shoving 21 blinds, but you lop off the very strongest part of your range. So you have to include that in there too. The only reason ever to flat here is if you think someone wouldn't be able to pick up on the fact that you have to be almost absurdly strong when you flat. By the way, I think if you're going to do that, I prefer a small three bet. So you get more chips in there and you get to isolate rather than, than calling here and letting the big blind in. Right, this is pure exploit. It's a, it just has to be based on the opener, Chris Van Dorsen being an amateur. And Andre making a lot of assumptions about him, too, by yeah. the way. Maybe they've played a lot in this tournament. I don't know. But you really have to assume that he's going to fold too often against the 22 big blind shove. And he's also going to give you more chips post-flop if he flops anything. And that combination is what you're going for. Because Chris Lee in the big blind is a good player. And you're letting him in with almost the whole deck out of position now against two players you're going to be playing. That's not an ideal situation. I think this is getting too fancy with exploit. I think shoving is better, even though, yeah, most of the time you just take the pot down pre-flop. But still, that's okay. You want to be able to shove with a bunch of hands. Aces has to be part of that, especially when you're in the small blind. By the way, we can see if Andre were to shove, he would absolutely get called by Chris, who now has one out. Like, Chris Lee yep. is not folding tens here. So it's... This is like what happens. Like Chris Lee's, I think, antenna go up, which is why he doesn't three bet tens here, because that's a pretty normal three bet in this spot, right? Yeah. And so, so Chris Lee's now on alert instead of just happily getting it in with us, where he's only got one out. Now he's on alert, and he may not. He's just not going to give us chips as easily as he otherwise would have. If you want to make some ill-advised flats out of the small blind, do it on Nitrogen Sports Poker because at least. If you're there, you still get to play the best iterated value in poker, Jonathan. Tell them about it. It's a thousand buy-ins guaranteed. That's right. I said a thousand. They only let a maximum of 300 players in. We usually get less than that. We get like 200 or so players, which means it's outrageous value. It costs like $1.60 to play as of right now because it's one-tenth of a millibit. They guarantee a thousand buy-ins. I know I already said that, but I needed to repeat it. It happens every month. You can only play in that tournament, though, if you sign up for Nitrogen Sports Poker using the link in our pinned tweet. There's our Twitter address one more time, just in case you don't remember it. They've got sports betting. They've got casino games. You're a fool not to play. Very interesting. And look, at there's a 10 on the flop, three of a kind. Incredible. This could spell big trouble for Andre here. Oh, now the rocket man is going to explode with a bet, it appears. Well, he... Gonna lead right out in bed here. 115. And I'll tell you one thing, if Chris Lee happens to pull the trigger and raises here, we're gonna have a giant pot. I remember Fish Tank was the pre-flop raiser here. Chris Lee just calling with the three tens. And Fish Tank also with tens, just just a pair of tens, of course, is also gonna call. Well, he's calling because he thinks if one of these guys would have flopped queens, they would have checked to him and maybe check raised him. And now a nine comes off. That's got to be a scare card for everybody, including Chris Lee, who flopped three tens, because it looks like a potential straight out there now. But the rocket man, Andre Niffler, 
of course, on the short stack. And again, he's going to plunge away. 150. About four something. Chris Lee saying, how much more you got, my victim? No, he's going to move it up to 425 to go. Fish tank gets out of the way and back on Andre. Now, he's only got 400, 500 left. The weirdest stand here. Well, Vance, the toughest thing about two aces is getting away from him. He may be able to get away from him because he let out here on the turn with this hand. He's finding out where he's at, though, when his opponent makes a big raise. Oh, man, they're so pretty. I want to show this one, kind of. I remember, he made this raise with a man sitting behind him, so he's got to have a hand here that most likely beats the two aces, and that's exactly the case. Good lay down by Andre there. Well, he saved his short stack. Nice saying, Chris. Well, well, that's a disappointing result for Chris Lee. Let's go back to the flop to see how we got here. We must talk about this lead by Andre. He is certainly playing this hand in a strange way. Does that mean it's bad? To me, I think it does in this case. I don't really like this lead. What do you think, Jonathan? I'm not a huge fan of it either. It seems to me this is a really natural check to check raise all in or effectively check raise all in. We don't actually have to put all the chips in, but we could put in enough chips that we're moving in on the turn. Uh, really naturally here, we get to shut out a lot of hands. We might get called, especially by the amateur, who, we, by the way, we flatted preflop specifically to trick him, we think, right? So if that's what we're doing, why would we lead out now, give him a chance to fold or play well against us? Let him see bet. This is the kind of board he's going to hit at least some of the time. We have to have a lot of information about, about Chris Van Dersen here that he's not see betting almost anything here except like top pair or better to be able to uh, lead. If we think that's the case, okay, I get it. But man, otherwise, I want to check to check raise. I absolutely want to check to check raise. If we're leading because we're afraid of check backs, well, that means Van Dersen has a lot of checkbacks on this flop, which is actually okay because those hands that are going to check back that Van Dersen has are probably also going to fold to this lead. That doesn't give it a lot of value. If Van Dersen has a hand like a queen, it would be great for us to get the check shove in because he will strongly have to consider calling with a hand like that. I think we just get way more value out of that. Now, as it stands, we're not getting any value because we're against a set of tens in Chris Lee's hand. But I think check shoving is definitely the the more plus EV play, certainly the higher variance play. But we played this hand this way so far to play high variance. Leading feels like we're changing our plan in a way that I don't really like. Now, he does lead. So that's the situation we're in as Chris Lee. Chris Lee flats. What do you think about that with the tens? I think mostly we should be raising right away here. Um, if we're Chris Lee, who's got... As I think I'm, um, I guess I didn't mention this. He's got over one million dollars worth of uh, tournament success, live tournament wins. Uh, he's a good player for sure. He almost certainly recognizes the preflop flat from the small blind on a twenty-one blind stack means a hand like aces, if only aces, perhaps uh, in Andre's range. I would say let's raise right now to try and not let Andre get away in case if something weird happens. Uh, Chris Van Dersen is behind us. Rarely he's going to be able to stick around, but he might fold anyway, even if we just call. Now, it turns out Chris V does flat with a hand that is really shouldn't be calling. So that's the one reason Chris Lee might be calling himself, as he knows Chris Van Dersen is just more likely to call than he should be. But I still like a raise here. Let's just shut out Chris Van Dersen and just get it in right now when we're almost always way ahead. Yeah, I think that's clearly the better plan. Uh so I don't, I don't really love either of the plays we've seen so far. And then you mentioned Van Dersen's call. I don't love that play either. No. So all of these plays in the flop, not ideal in my mind. We get to the turn, and this is not a good turn for aces. It's not Terrible. a good turn for a set of tens for that matter. But for aces, it's, it's worse. There's more stuff that comes in that can beat aces now. Yet, we find Andre betting again. He bets really small, 150 into 615. What is his goal here? Is he blocker betting what is he doing we do know he folds ultimately so is this a blocker bet what's your game andre that's my best sean connery as an honor to him i'm trying to honor yeah. him right now rest in peace uh, yeah i don't i don't i will now beat you to death with my thumb that's from the presidio so um i don't know what he's doing or why he's betting here he has two callers. That nine, as you said, is a terrible card. It makes some two pair of hands, but much more. It brings in the obvious nuts, the king jack. Why are we betting? Don't we? 
in theory, I think what we want to do is we want to check. We hope Chris Lee checks too, because Chris Lee probably has a good sense of what we have. We want Chris V to bet his top pair or whatever he has. Now we can check raise again and hope to get in against a guy who may not be as on top of how strong our range really is. Maybe we can get in against a top pair type hand. That'd be my plan. Betting feels like kind of just like setting chips on fire and disaster type situations a lot. I agree. Um, but he does it. I think what happened overall with Andre's mindset in this hand is he started the hand trying to play high variance and then he ha- hit the flop and he changed his mind for some reason. He's like, oh, I yeah. got to play this hand to find out where I am and, and make sure that I stay in this tournament, which I think is the wrong way to think when you're one of the two bottom stacks in the tournament. I think he should be playing this hand high variance, especially if he's going to flat at preflop. Now, he does make this lead and Lee raises, which we see doesn't work out for him super well. Right. But is it a necessary raise anyway? I think it probably is because there are three ways. Do you agree? I would like to say that if I could date this raise, if I could take this raise out to the prom, I would. You know, I would be very excited to put a corsage on this on this raise because okay. I love it. Um, not only do I love the fact that he raises, which is, I mean, pretty, pretty straightforward in a lot of ways, right? We don't want to let Van Jersen draw to what, what's going to be a straight, um, a fair amount of the time. Um, number one, but number two, okay. We don't block the nuts at all here. Van Jersen absolutely can have King Jack by making it 425 instead of the more obvious 680,000, which is all of Andre's chips. Well, we actually a save money when Van Jersen has the nuts and he decides to re-raise right here, like by going all in or making a big enough raise that we have to fold. We put in less chips. Or maybe we make it that Van Dersen raises small enough that we can actually call and then reevaluate on the river, see if the board pairs, and if it doesn't, reevaluate, basically, and probably have to fold, of course, to a big bet. I kind of love it in all these different ways. I'm ready to settle down and have kids with this race. Okay, I don't know if I'm as excited about it, but the sizing is pretty great for the reasons that you described. And I do think the raise is necessary because it's three ways and there's too much to protect against. So, yeah, I'm with you. It's good. How about this fold? This is like Mm. next level stuff is what it looks like. When people fold aces, it's a big deal. But is it that big of a deal? Like, isn't this kind of an obvious fold, actually, when you think about it? The ultimate question being, what are the bluffs? The answer being... It has to be something super above the rim. It has to be something like King, Queen, or Jack, Nine from Chris Lee, where he's like, well, I know that Andre only has aces or kings, so he can't love that turn card. I block the nuts. I can improve in case he decides to hold on, so I'm going to bluff with these hands because I think he's going to fold aces or kings. That's a stretch, right? Other than that, he can easily have the nuts himself. He can have King, Jack. He can have sets, as we see. He can have two pair type hands like Queen, Ten, Queen, Nine, hands like that. I think it's a clear fold. I think it's a good fold by Andre. Do you agree? I completely agree. Um, Andre knows he has to fold when he gets raised here. You can see he like he goes through the, all the stages of pain, but he's clearly folding almost right away. I think you can see it in his eyes. Um, and you notice how Chris Lee is completely unimpressed by the aces when he sees them. He even says, that's what I thought you had. Because, yeah, of course, Andre. Andre knows that Chris Lee knows he has aces, and Chris Lee knows that Andre knows he has aces. Andre makes a good fold for sure, but a very, I think, ultimately straightforward one. It looks more showy than it is. Pretty interesting hand there, folks. A lot of unusual decisions. A lot of things we did not agree with or support, although there's a few plays. We actually like the river plays, most of the river plays anyway, a fair amount. What do you guys think? What do you think is the thing that you saw in this hand, the decision by a player that you most agree with and really, I guess, more to the point, most disagree with. Like, what do, you, what do you think is the biggest mistake? We thought there were many mistakes in this hand. We really didn't love how Andre played most of it, most of it except the fold on the, on the turn there. Um, let us know in the comments. We always want to hear what you have to say. Chime in! Chime in and check out our podcast where we come up with all of these ideas. If you want to get way more in-depth on the hand than we did in this video, it's the Breakdown Poker Podcast with the Poker Guys. Two of them come out every week. It's great fun. It's grand, even, people might say. Just like our book. Here's a picture of it. It's called How Can He Fold? Tell them about it, Jonathan. It's wonderful. We break down 37 different hands, one by one. They're all tournament hands, like this one was. And let me tell you, they start off kind of kind of cool and kind of interesting, and then they get really complicated by the end. So almost no matter where you are in your poker experience, wherever you are on the spectrum, you have an opportunity to learn, enjoy, and think more deeply about hands. You're going to be able to see how Grant and I break down hands all the way down to the bottom. It's an awesome book. It's cheap. You really should get it. 
There is a link in the description of this video that will take you to that book, so check it out.